Now, another thing that happened during the 1920s was the rise of fundamentalism. And um, that really, um, we talk about fundamentalists, we're really talking about people that took a very literal translation of the Bible. And particularly within the Protestant faith, this really began to gain hold uh, during the 1920s. We saw a big rise in fundamentalism. Um, many people turned to religion, particularly in the rural areas. And uh, one of the leading uh, religious figures of the time was a former baseball player named Billy Sunday, uh, who condemned radicals and he criticized the changing attitudes of women, reflecting much of white rural America's ideals. Sunday's Christian beliefs, once again, were based on fundamentalism, this literal translation of the Bible. Uh, he also, of course, was, was very much supportive of prohibition, which was uh, the movement to ban the manufacture, uh, sale, and transportation of alcoholic beverages. <laughs> Civilization and society rests on morals. Morals rest on religion. Religion rests on the Bible and faith in God and in Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't condemn any man because of his wealth. The Bible says the man that don't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. According to our standard of gold and silver, Abraham was worth a billion and a half of dollars. David was worth three billion. Solomon was worth five billion. Solomon could have hired Andrew Carnegie for a butler, J. Pierpont Morgan to cut his lawn, and Andrew Mellon for a chauffeur, and John D. to black his boots. America needs a tidal wave of the old-time religion. America needs to be taken down to God's bathhouse and the hose turned on her. And the time isn't far distant when the wheels of God's judgment are going to go sweeping through this old God-hating world. And I want to take a pledge in this audience to join me in a pledge that you will never rest until this old God-hating, Christ-hating, whiskey-soaked, Sabbath-breaking, blaspheming, infidel, bootlegging old world is bound to the cross of Jesus Christ by the golden chains of love. Uh, another major fundamentalist preacher at the time that was very well known was Amy Semple McPherson. And she seemed to embrace the kind of glamour that other fundamentalists had warned about, but her religion, however, was purely fundamentalist. Leaving Los Angeles for New York and the boat upon which we sail immediately, I was met en route by multitudes of our friends. Among them ever was a liberal sprinkling of newspaper men. And in each city, they asked the same question, Sister McPherson, what do you think of prohibition? It was rather difficult to answer the question in such a few words as one must use them. But I told them that the case of our prohibition here in the United States reminds me of the story of the lecturer who gave a marvelous address on prohibition. And he wound up in a blaze of glory that brought everyone to their feet enthusiastically. Why, he said, my friends, if I had my way, do you know what I'd do? I'd take every barrel of liquor, every bottle of booze, every crate, and I'd empty it in the river. Yes, sir. Then he said, shall we now close our meeting by rising and singing together, shall we gather at the river? He'd spoiled it all. And that's the way perhaps with us over here in America. We teach it, but so often those who profess to make the laws do not quite live up to them and back them themselves. I wish that you could all have the joy of going with us this Easter tide to the Holy Land, where we shall visit on Easter Day the tomb of our risen Lord. She was especially well known for healing the sick through prayer. And now another uh, outcome, I guess you'd say, of this uh, fundamentalist movement were that many states began to adopt laws banning the teaching of evolution. Of course, evolution was based on Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. Uh, in 1859, Darwin had published his book on the origin of species by natural selection, uh, in which he explained the process of evolution through natural selection. 
which basically states that uh, individuals within a population that have a genetic advantage will be more likely to survive and pass that trait on to their offspring, making that trait more common in a population. Well, those, you know, that idea um, <clears throat> many Christians felt was, was uh, contrary to the teachings of the Bible, particularly the idea that man had evolved from an ape-like species long ago. And so, like I said, many of these fundamentalists um, had pushed for laws that were banning the teaching of evolution in schools. One such state was Tennessee, which they passed a law in 1925 banning the teaching of evolution in their schools. Now, a group wanted to challenge that practice, and so they, they found a, or they really wanted to challenge, in other words, that law. Um, and, and really the main process in the United States, if you want to really challenge a law, you, you want to get it before the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court is, of course, the highest court in the land, and they have the power of judicial review. The court can, in effect, nullify a law that it feels violates the Constitution. And so, uh, but you have to have a case. You can't take an issue to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court doesn't rule on issues. It rules on case law. So they have to have a case. So a group that wanted to uh, have a case to be able to challenge convinced a young science te teacher named John T. Scopes to teach evolution and get arrested so that they could have this case. Well, that happens, and then the two attorneys in the case uh, are very well known. The prosecution is led by William Jennings Bryan, a three-time presidential nominee, uh, somebody who was very well known in American society, and he was a fundamentalist. So he takes the role of the prosecutor for this, this trial. Another very well-known attorney who was actually a friend of uh, Bryan's was Clarence Darrow and he takes the defense. So, you know, today we're very used to seeing high-profile trials that uh, end up receiving a lot of coverage on television. Well, television, like I said, wasn't around in the 1920s, but what was was radio and certainly newspaper. And the newspapers ran the stories on the Scopes trial, radio covered the trial, the reporters lined up outside the courthouse, uh, people showed up on the street and were selling monkeys. The trial was dubbed the monkey trial. Uh, so like I said, people were selling like sock monkeys and stuff outside of his kind of souvenirs. Uh, it, it really kind of developed like a circus-like atmosphere. And one thing that was highly unusual uh, in the course of this case was that Clarence Darrow called William Jennings Bryan, or the defense attorney, called the prosecuting attorney as a witness in the trial. Very unusual thing to do, uh, but he did that because Bryan was considered to be an expert on the Bible. So Darrow calls Bryan, puts him on the stand, and more or less ridicules him because of his, his beliefs in a literal translation of the Bible. Now this is, uh, it's effective, but ultimately doesn't make a difference with the jury. And of course, really the case was, was about bigger issues. It really wasn't about whether or not uh, Scopes had violated the law. It was clear that he had. I mean, he clearly and deliberately broke the law by teaching the theory of evolution. What was really on trial here was the law. Uh, in the end, as expected, the jury found Scopes guilty. However, they never really had the opportunity to appeal the case because ultimately um, Scopes ends up being found guilty, he's fined $100, and then the conviction was overturned because of a technical error made on the part of the judge. And so the law, the law in Tennessee banning evolution stayed on the books until uh, sometime in the 1960s. So they really weren't able to move forward with the case in the way that they initially had intended. Um, William Jennings Bryan actually died shortly after the case, and some people think that the stress from the case uh, may have contributed to his, his untimely death. Uh, another effect of this fundamentalist uh, movement that was going on in the country was prohibition. Uh, 
throughout U.S. history, groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union have fought for prohibition, the banning of alcohol. And so it gained some momentum during the early 1900s when progressives joined, uh, joined the cause. And then, of course, during World War I, with their, you know, the tremendous need for, for more resources, particularly food, to feed the troops overseas, uh, the main sources for making alcohol, grain and grapes, um, were in, in short supply. And that provided even more support for prohibition. So the 18th Amendment went into effect. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, a number of states had passed anti-alcohol laws, uh, but World War I really helped to push the whole national movement over the edge. So the 18th Amendment put prohibition into effect, and then it was enforced uh, through the Volstead Act. Um, and, you know, the fight against alcohol also used bias against immigrants, for example, uh, Irish, the Irish in particular were portrayed as drunks, kind of still a stereotype that exists even today. Uh, and that was used as a way to, um, you know, portray different immigrant groups as alcoholics, as people talked about all the so-called social evils. Uh, and of course, many Protestant fundamentalist groups also supported prohibition. And so it goes into effect, but it really proves to be a disaster. Um, in practice, it proved to be very difficult to enforce, as it was still legal to consume alcohol. It was only illegal to make it, to transport it, or sell it. Um, so, you know, and once again, many people didn't really see a problem with consuming alcohol. And so, you know, e even sometimes police officers um, bought alcohol. Plus, the fact that it could be transported or sold illegally uh, also gave rise to great criminal empires. So, uh, you know, many smuggling operations were developed and a great deal of money was generated through selling illegal alcohol or making it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, many alcohol slipped into the country through states like Michigan that were on the Canadian border. Um, so, you know, policing this became really, really difficult. And newspaper followed the hunt. Uh, newspapers followed the hunt for bootleggers uh, or liquor smugglers. But government officials estimated that by 1925 they only caught about five percent out of all the illegal liquor that was entering the country. Which, actually, interestingly enough, if we look at the the fight to stop uh, illegal marijuana entering the country, we're really talking about fairly similar numbers. Um, they only catch or an estimated about 5% of the marijuana that is being smuggled across the Mexican border. Uh, so, you know, much of the same way we have a problem with illegal drugs and trying to stop it, they had a problem with trying to st stop the, the liquor smuggling. Um, plus, you know, many people made their own liquor using homemade equipment, uh, such as bath, bathtub gin, um, and others got alcohol from doctors who could prescribe it as a, as a medicine. And that might sound very familiar because, uh, like, for example, here in California, we have medicinal marijuana laws. And uh, I think many people are well, well aware that there are doctors out there who will give those prescriptions out pretty freely. Uh, so there's a lot of people that don't really have a major ailment that will, uh, you know, basically be able to get a medicinal use card uh, so that they can use marijuana recreationally. And that was happening with alcohol as well. So, um, but, you know, a, a particular note when we talk about the organized crime, it, it was big gangsters that really um, made a ton of money. And the most famous of all of them was Al Capone. Uh, Al Capone really controlled Chicago uh, and the liquor trade. Um, he frightened and bribed police and officials, uh, used tremendous violence, um, and he eventually did end up being arrested. They could, were never able to pin any of the murders that he was responsible for, any of the violent acts, or even really uh, the illegal liquor directly on him, although they knew he was behind it. What they were able to prove is that he failed to pay taxes over several years. And so when they were able to prove that he had received an income that he failed to pay taxes on, 
they convicted him of income tax evasion, and eventually he would die uh, in Alcatraz prison. Uh, I, I believe it was syphilis that he uh, ended up dying from. Um, but, uh, you know, they were able to bring him down, but not, not for specifically the violent acts that he, he used. Um, all in all, there were about 3,000 prohibition agents nationwide that worked to shut down speakeasies or illegal bars uh, and to capture illegal liquor and to stop the gangsters. Uh, but there were often problems because millions of Americans violated the laws and sometimes uh, you had cops that were on the take. I mean, police officers could, in just a few days, make their annual salary by simply calling in sick to work in some cases. Some of these prohibition agents, literally, just call in sick for four days and they could make just as much money by being paid off as what they would make during a whole year of legal work. So, you know, that, that type of enticement uh, only encouraged the illegal action. <clears throat> so eventually, uh, 1933, prohibition was repealed. Primarily, uh, prohibition was repealed because this was during the middle of the Great Depression and the government needed more tax revenue and they knew that they could generate more tax revenue by taxing liquor if they made it legal. 